Uh, well, you can prove the prime number theorem, but the prime number theorem doesn't really need the notion of addition. Uh, you can just count how many things are in a box. Um, right, so um, yeah, the Berlin primes are, are good for modeling purely multiplicative properties of the primes, but not anything involving addition. Yeah. Yes, over there. You said that primes can, for example, be used to encrypt messages. Mm -hmm. So there, finding shapes in the future seemingly has no practical purpose. Do you sometimes prove that it's done? Uh, right, so I, I'm, yeah, I, I am primarily a pure mathematician. Uh, I mean, tomorrow I'll talk about uh, some of my work that actually does have some applications, uh, more direct applications. Um, typically, um, the, the results we prove from pure mathematics, um, yeah, they're very theoretical. Um, even when they do touch on practical results, they, they often um, are... Um, um, uh, the bounds they give are, are, are too impractical for any, for any given purpose. I mean, a, a good example is, is uh, the Nagrados theorem, for instance. Uh, every large number is the sum of three primes. Uh, it's, it's a great result until you, uh, but for practical purposes, once you realize that n has to be bigger than 10 to the 1346, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, so useful directly. Um, there, are, actually, there are some applications of this to other areas of pure mathematics, but I think it's not what you're talking about. Um, but um, what, what happens in mathematics often is that um, ideas in pure mathematics, you know, they come out and they, um, you know, for, for many decades they, are, they have no uh, pure, uh, direct application. But you know, as they're digested and, and, and understood, eventually uh, someone who's an applied mathematician or an engineer or a scientist will look at these, um, uh, uh, these mathematics and, and realize, oh, there's a connection to something very practical. For example, the mathematics that underlies um, all this cryptography. Um, it goes back to Cauchy and, and, and uh, um, it goes back to the 19th century. And these, these mathematicians were just playing with primes for, you know, uh, like much the same reason that, 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 that I do, just for, uh, you know, uh, because they're beautiful and, and, and a very classical subject. And, you know, Cauchy had no idea that this would lead to, to public key cryptography. Uh, it was uh, only in, in the 70s that, that someone made the connection. So you, you, you never really know with pure mathematics. It's, it's, um, we develop things for their own sake, but they, they often do turn out to be useful later. Thank you very much. Any last final question? And on top there, in the back. How much of the uh, number theory research in particular time, number theory in your work in this area, is uh, limited to the, the use of base scan analysis? Okay, so the question is to what extent does, um, um, does our use of uh, um, uh, just our results on the prime numbers on the, on the base 10 system. Uh, so we, in fact, actually do not use the base 10 system at all um, in, in, in our work. Um, it's, uh, I mean, the, the decimal system is a convenient way to, to, to represent primes, to represent numbers um, for the purposes of, 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 of human, of reading, of, for a human to read them. But um, uh, you, we don't actually need to, uh, uh, um, uh, to do, I mean, we just do numbers extra abstractly. You know, we, uh, we, we will call it a number n, and we don't need to, to expand into digits. You know, and, and the computer work, of course, when you do numerical work, uh, you know, computers don't use base 10, you know, they use binary. But you know, numbers are numbers. Whether you, you read them in binary or base 10 or just abstractly, I mean, it, 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 that doesn't affect, um, you, know, you know, I mean, for example, our theorem is true in base 10 or base 7. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't really use base. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't directly rely on, on, on representation systems for numbers. No further questions. <laughs> okay. I mean, there are connections, but um, okay. So, well, okay. I'll tell you one connection. Um, if p is equal to n p, then there exists a fast algorithm to to factor to factor large numbers. Okay. That if p equals n p, then you should be able to factor a, mil a million-digit prime number in in a, in a reasonable amount of time. A million-digit non-prime number in a, in a in a reasonable amount of time. So, um, okay, so uh, although convert the converse is not quite true, it, 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 if, if there is a fast factoring algor algorithm, that, that would shake our belief that P is not good MP, but it would not completely uh, destroy it. So it's possible that someone being very clever at prime numbers may discover a very um, fast factoring algorithm, and that, would, uh, uh, that wouldn't quite settle the P equals MP problem, but it would certainly uh, stimulate a lot of uh, uh, shift in thinking. Um, very recently, a few years ago, there was a breakthrough um, testing whether a number is prime was shown to be, uh, 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 it could be done efficiently with polynomial time. Uh, that if, you, we, if you're given a million digit number, uh, you can test in a reasonable amount of time whether it's prime or not. Um, 
But that, that's not the same as factoring. It's just saying whether, whether a number's prime. Uh, uh, um, so either it's prime or can, it, it can be factored, but it doesn't tell you how to factor it further. So that was uh, yeah, the, uh, the AKS algorithm. That was a, a big breakthrough a few years back. So there's a few connections, but uh, well, we don't know, okay? Uh, we don't know what kind of mathematics would be needed to solve the P equals MP problem. It could well be number theory. Okay. Yes, one at the end. Finn? <laughs> and he's actually the first person who ever made some contributions towards these connectors of low buck and the twin front connectors. Right. <laughs> okay, I know did not I <laughs> Actually, I did not know that. Yeah, so, so Viggo Brun is actually a, quite a hero. In, uh, he, he founded the, the field of modern SIF theory. Um, so um, one of his first results, uh, one, so uh, one of his results is uh, what's called Brun's theorem. Um, so uh, he showed that if you take, um, he, so, he showed that, the, that there may be infinitely many twin primes. He, he didn't settle this question. But he showed in some sense there's not too many twin primes. He showed that if you take all the twin primes in the world and you take the reciprocal, so what is the twin primes? Yeah, so if you take 1 over 3, 1 over 5, 1 over 11, 1 over 13, you take the reciprocal of all these primes and you, you add the reciprocals together, uh, the sum is convergent. It's converges to a finite number. It's called Bruin's constant. Um, and uh, so in some sense, that means that there are not too many twin primes in the world. Because if you take the reciprocals of all the numbers in the world, 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, that diverges. That's the harmonic series. But the, the twin primes, the reciprocals converge. That was, that was his theorem. It was a, it was a very nice result. Um, yeah, so he, he, he is one of the founders of SIV theory, which, which has since been it's a, it's a fundamental tool in all, all, all of these results. Okay. Um, so before we thank uh, Terry Tal for a beautiful lecture, I would like to remind everybody that tomorrow at 11 to 12, he will give another lecture on compressed sensing, not in this uh, lecture hall, but in AL2 in Electro. So let's thank Terry Tal for a beautiful lecture. Thank you.